Okay, I turned the volume up a little bit more. Is that better? Okay. Uh, there is a little bit more volume I can turn up. Let me know. But the fans only got one speed or two off and on. So I guess I'm going to live with it on. Try to talk loud here. So, yeah, I'm Gary Hatt. I'm with Bus Conversion Magazine. I've been uh, living in a bus for 25 years now. I kind of started before it was a cool thing, and I just kind of caught on to it early, and I always wanted to do something like that. So I travel full time around the country traveling uh, to gather stories about bus conversions, people that have done them, and, and different types of conversions. We did a tractor trailer conversion once. We're going to do a horse trailer conversion. The horse trailer is out here. She's going to write an article. So we kind of do several conversions. Um, something that's unique is kind of what we look for. We kind of mostly do bus conversions, both over the road buses and schoolie buses. We cover both. We alternate every other month. So this is the cover of a couple of our magazines here. On the left is an Eagle bus. It's probably a 1972 Eagle or something. And there's a school bus on the right. It's probably like a 72, 74, I'm guessing. I'm not real familiar with school buses myself. I've always had an over the road bus, but I kind of yearn for a school bus for a long time because they've got a lot more ground clearance, obviously, and I like to get off the beaten path. So we'll get started here. The text is kind of small. I apologize for that. I had a 14 uh, year old girl put this together. And we can make it available for you to read later if you want but I'll basically cover everything on the, on the slides anyway. So this is about the do's and don'ts of bus conversions. I gave a talk up in Colorado about bus conversion. And now we'll cover the do's and don'ts specifically of a bus conversion, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. If you watch YouTube and you're on the internet, things that are done, and I see those myself. And I used to be an EMT and a firefighter, so I see some things people may not see okay so um, there's some things I'll point out of what you want to do and what you don't want to do so we'll start out with you want to learn a little bit about buses uh, and decide on what kind of bus you want before you buy anything you get a choice first of all of a schoolie or an over-the-road bus now an over-the-road bus is going to be probably twice the money up front but you got huge storage bays which has an advantage we'll talk about here it also rides a lot smoother than a school bus. Uh, an over-the-road bus, like my bus is out here, it's a ribbon-painted side. It'll go an hour down the road if you want to. I usually cruise 62, like that. I like going too fast because uh, it's a big bus. Okay, the over-the-road buses are smoother. Like I said, the schoolies will go more places, and they don't have the storage capacity. I can store a lot of stuff in my bus. I'm a full-timer. I have been for 25 years, so I carry everything I own in that bus, okay? So I need a lot of space. You wanna learn about the parts availability. My bus is a 1967 bus, okay? They made it 50 something years ago. Parts are harder to get for that because that bus is no longer in production. So that's something you wanna look for when you buy a bus. Now I can get parts, usually, if I don't, I gotta make them. I had to make parts up in Oregon, Oregon uh, in Eugene, a couple of years ago when I needed them. I could have found them eventually, but I needed them and I wanted them that day. So I took the old part to a, down to a machine shop and had it built, okay? I had to design and built. I brought the parts or the raw materials in and he made up the part for me that I needed. School buses generally are not that old. They're not 50 years old. When they take them offline, they may be only 10 years old. So those parts are more readily available. And school buses can be worked on a lot more places than an over the road bus. An over the road bus, um, you, you kind of got a specialist to go, you got to go to a specialist or a truck repair facility to do a lot of the work. Um, I do a lot of the work myself on my own bus. I have my grease monkey suit I carry with me all the time. And I was in the rest area three days ago, crawling under and adjusting the brakes. You know, it's just, it, they take, they quite, take quite a bit of personal care and feeding to keep them going when they're that old. But my bus is over four million miles on it and I still drive it every day. It, if you maintain them, they'll go forever. There's practically no limit. In Mexico, I go down to Mexico every year once or twice, and they've got like 10 million miles on a lot of their buses they're running down there, passenger buses they transport people in. Okay, so a bus, first of all, is the, one of the safest forms of travel. They're built to roll over and walk out from under them, you know, a, a stick and staple motor home, as we call them. If they roll over, then you've got to clean them up with a bucket loader and a dump truck, basically. A bus is really 
secure. You can roll it over, you can drop it. A, a school bus you can drop on its roof from like 10 feet and it doesn't crush it much at all. That's what they're designed to do. So they're one of the safest forms of travel. So if you're looking at a conversion, you know, a bus, a school bus, or an over-the-road bus are very safe. So parts are available um, for the newer buses. For the older buses, they may or not be. Now, I've got a big network, of course, because I own Bus Conversion Magazine, and I can get most parts for my bus somewhere in the country. I might have to go get them myself or have them shipped in, or I might have to have them taken off another bus. But I know there's a lot of scrap buses around. I can go get parts when I need them. So that's something to look out for. It's going to cost you money to maintain these buses, so you should find a bus that you know, is in pretty good shape to start with. Um, you also want to check for rust. That's what the next bullet item is. If you've got a lot of rust on your bus, and Eagles are notorious for rust. I mean, the guy that bought this bus and fixed it up, um, the guy that did the work says, I don't even know how you got it here. It should have fallen apart. The whole front end was rusty, but, you know, after 3 million miles, it's going to be rusty, especially driving in the northeast. And if you were to buy a bus, you know, if you could find one in the southwest, of course, they're in a lot better condition. So look for rust. Surface rust is okay. That can be painted over and sealed. Um, when you get through rust, you can fix any bus. My, I've seen buses that, I mean, they're just about a piece of scrap, but people will spend time and fix them up. The only thing is it's going to take a while to do it, okay? So you want to try to buy a bus that was recently in service, too. If you've got a bus that's been sitting for five or ten years, on a lot or in a field, I mean, that could take a lot of work because once you start driving it, there's rust in the alternator and it starts wearing things out and that can be a bad thing, okay? So try to get one that was recently in service if you have a choice. When you buy a bus, uh, we recommend that you try a bus out first. There's places you can rent buses like this, places like Tin Valley Retro Rentals, for example, down in Tequila, you can live in a bus and show before you um, buy one. They won't let you drive them around, but there's a whole lot of them. Or rent one if you can find a rent car to rent. But once in a while, there are B&B people. If they're not renting a bus, you know, live in there for a few days and see if you like it or travel with somebody. Attend as many bus rallies as you can. Now, the bus rallies I go to, the over-the-road bus rally and schoolie rallies, everybody lets you come in and tour their bus. So if you're looking for ideas or thinking about it, go talk to those people first. You know, if you go to a couple bus rallies and talk to people, they're going to tell you the goods and the bads, and they're going to always lean towards the good because they want to promote what they're doing, of course. But, you know, ask them what to watch out for, and they'll tell you what to watch out for, like rust and stuff like that and parts availability. Learn the local laws. There's been people that have bought buses, brought them home, and then they get a knock on the door the next day. Next day, it's the HOA and a policeman there, you know, asking you to move your bus because you can't have a bus there. So then you got to find a place to store it and work on it, and that could cost you $100 a month or much more to park it someplace where you can work on it because you just can't park them in any storage lot and go in with power tools and work on them. You've got to have something that's zoned for actually um, mechanical work. Okay, and Those are a little harder to find and cost a little more. If you own a farm someplace or your parents do or your friends do, then you're all set. You can work on your bus there. But you just can't park a bus on the city street and work on it in a lot of the places. So you need to know what your rules are before you get the bus home. Learn about the common things, types of buses that tend to wear out, like an MCI bus or Prevost, they have airbags. After 20 years, you're probably going to have to repair their airbags or replace them, I mean. It's not a hard job, but it's something you've got to do. If you can do the work yourself, that's fine. Airbags are 150 bucks a piece, maybe. You can replace them all for three or 400 bucks, and you've got nice airbags. You got to check the brakes. You probably have to replace the brakes. They may or may not have been replaced unless the bus was in service recently. So that's going to cost you some money. So you need to know what kind of repairs you are going to be needed. The best advice I can give anybody if they're going to buy a bus is hire somebody to go look at the bus in those buses, okay? Because they can look through and they'll see things you don't see and they'll estimate what it'll cost to bring it up to spec, okay? And there's a guy that converted seven buses up in Chicago and he wrote an article for us once. And uh, I actually met the guy. He's an old German guy, a really interesting guy. But he discovered that he's bought old buses for like three or four thousand dollars, and he's bought fifty thousand dollar buses and converted them. By the time he got done with that five thousand dollar bus, he had fifty thousand dollars into it in repairs. And the bad thing for you is, if you're doing that on a personal level.
the time that you're going to be getting on the road. So that's something to look after. It may be better to spend a little more and get a bus that's on the road ready. Oil changes. Oil changes are in gallons. I just changed my oil. It took nine gallons. And if I would have changed the fuel filters, which I usually do, I mean, you're talking $300 for an oil change if you do it yourself. If you hire it out, it's $500 for a service change. And that's not even including grease in the chassis, and there's 132 grease fittings in my bus. So if you don't know how to grease the bus, you're going to have to pay somebody to do that, okay? So if you buy yourself a grease gun and get under there and grease it every year, you're all set. You can save a lot of money. Grease is cheap. But it's a chore. you got to do it or your bus is going to wear out parts prematurely and squeak and stuff like that. So you want to make a list of everything that um, needs to be done on a bus before you buy it. You want to look through it and you want to deduct dollars for everything that needs to be done. Then you, you can decide if it's worth fixing or not. Okay, But you've got to spend some time in a pre-inspection. And I've seen people spend you know, four to six hours just looking a bus over before they even decide to buy it. Unless you're getting it real cheap and you know what you're doing, then you're fine. But it may be good to hire somebody for two to five hundred dollars to go out and look at a bus that already has some experience and tell you what needs to be done. Preparation and design. Before you start, you want to make a list of everything you want in the bus. Do you want a sink? Do you want a washer dryer? Do you want air conditioners and all that? Okay. Everything costs money. So you want to look at all the major appliances, refrigerator, what type do you want? Do you want an LP gas or do you want an electric refrigerator? A lot of people are with all electric refrigerators now because they're pretty efficient. You get to decide everything you want and make a list and put prices on them. And then once you get done, you want to double that amount because it's going to cost you at least twice that in fitting, screws, nuts, and bolts on the hardware. Hardware, everything's gone through the roof lately. Okay, tires, a good set of tires. Here from Phoenix, I need new tires, and I had them put on then. I ordered them, but they weren't going to be in in time for me to get out of here. So I let 10 pounds out of each tire, and I drove a little slower. Okay, but tires are 500 bucks a piece. I've got six tires on my bus. Most people have eight, so that quick. And you, any any bus that's got tires over seven years old, you got to buy tires. That's about all you want to get out of these, because when a tire blows, if it's a steer tire, really bad. If it's a rear tire. That can be bad too. Even on these old buses, it can tear out a wheel well or something. Then you're talking thousands of dollars worth of work and downtime. Okay, so always check the tires. You generally need tires and batteries with almost any bus you bought, unless it just came out of service. Because most people don't put new tires on their buses when they're getting ready to sell them. Okay. You want to hang around with people that know more than you. That's the second bullet item. So you want to start going to bus rallies, talking to people, getting to know people, ask them their opinion and you want to read everything you can and study everything about buses. Now, I've owned Bus Conversion Magazine for 10 years, but, but it's been a service 30 years, that magazine. So I read every article in there before I even bought a bus. I went and bought every back issue. I actually made a deal with a guy. I organized all his magazines for one of everyone free, but I read every article and every issue before I even bought a bus. So I kind of knew what I was getting into more than most people. And the reason I bought a bus is because I like their ruggedness and, and how, heavy, how heavy duty they were and how many miles you could put on. Because I had a, a Fleetwood Discovery stick and staple motorhome with 70,000 miles and I was doing repairs on it that I think should be necessary at that time at 70,000 miles. Just some simple brackets and some things were falling apart. And my neighbor had a bus and I told him about that. I said, well, how many miles do you have on your bus? He said, oh, half a million. So I thought, well, that's when I started getting into buses, okay, because they'll go the, a long way. So like it says in the last paragraph, make a list of everything you want to have in your bus. But include the wood that you want for the inside, the framing, all the plumbing and everything. And then pretty much double it because it'll cost you double, especially nowadays. If you can buy a wrecked RV and drag it home, you've already got your water heater, you've got sinks. You've got a lot of stuff that you can buy half price or much less if you buy the whole wreck yourself. Um, you can save a lot of money. Or if you go down to Arizona Salvage in Phoenix, you can buy all these appliances. They buy wrecked RVs and pull them out and have them on the shelf. But if you buy your own wrecked RV, which you can get out of junkyards, you, you get you know probably 80% of the appliances you need right there. And you might need to replace the refrigerator or something, but a lot of them get wrecked pretty early, okay? Because a lot of people are buying them, especially now. They don't know how to handle a big rig like that. They 
swerve in the road and they go over. Well, it's pretty well totaled, but everything in there is fine still. You want to design for fire protection. Now, that emergency exit in there, a lot of people cover those over or they put it in there. You don't want to do that because if you roll a bus on you may only have one way out. You, may, you, you think you can just you know, reach up and open the window when it's on the side, but you can't. That's eight feet away. You can't even climb on stuff and get out that way because you've got to open it, plus you've got to push it up. You can't do it. Um, the back door, if you've got it, just roof where you're safe. That's the only way to get out of those. If it's on fire, you don't want to pull around. You've got to get out. Now, the other way is to punch out the windshield, which you can do. But that's a lot of work trying to break a windshield. Okay. If you try to break a windshield, you can't break that way. So leave the roof hatches in if you've got them. That's your best way out. You want to carry a fire extinguisher. You really want to carry three on your bus, one in the back, one in the front, and one on the outside. And there's a good article about that on our blog about fire extinguishers written by a firefighter. And he tells you what type of fire extinguishers they have, too. And you want flares, not flares, you don't want flares anymore. You want these triangles. If you break down on the side of the road, you want to put those triangles out and know the interval. It's like every 50 feet or something. I forgot what it is now. But flares, they, they kind of frown on now because they've started too many fires because when so a crash happens or something bad happens, you got a fuel leak, then it's running down the side of the road and the flares will roll down, start the fire, then you got a big mess. So these road triangles are really the way to go now and they're pretty cheap. For 30 bucks, you can get a whole set. You want to... It says to carry a spare tire, tire, but that's that could go either way. If you can't change your own tire, um, you may not want to carry a spare. New rigs don't come with spare tires because you just can't change them. It's, it, they're really heavy tires. Now, I carry one, and I can change it if I have to, even at 70 years old. But I'll call road service before I'll change my own tire, if I've got cell service and all that. And if nothing else, I've got a tire I can put on because you may not be able to find the tire size you want, especially now, tires are hard to find. But if you've at least got a tire, they can come out and put it on for you, okay? And you probably want to purchase roadside assistance. I have coach now, it's like 100 bucks a year, 150, I don't know what it is, because I paid advance for it. But if anything happens, you've got to be towed. It can cost you five bucks a mile to tow your bus. But if you have roadside assistance, they'll come out and they'll tow it. If you run out of fuel, I've done that a couple of times. They'll come out and bring you fuel. Um, my gas gauge doesn't work, fuel gauge, so once in a while I run out. But that's my own stupidity and there's always something else behind it there. But anyway, they'll come out and bring you fuel. Um, they'll bring you tires. They'll come out and change your tire and they'll do all that. And that's pretty cheap insurance if you're going to live on the road full time like I do. You also want to have smoke detectors. Any firefighters say that because you may be sleeping in the night or whatever. And you may not know your bus is burning up with smoke. You want an LPG. When you're in stop traffic or in a tunnel or something. Um, but they're still good to have. You want to label your doors outside. If you've got an LP gas tank outside, put a label on it, LP gas outside. That's not a law in most states, but it's a good idea because if you get in an accident, the fire department, the first thing they're going to do is turn off your LP gas. The second thing they're going to do is cut the battery cable if there's a fire at all because those will keep a fire going whether, uh, no matter what or start a fire. So label your LP gas doors unless they're really obvious on the back of your bus or something. If you're going to be going into cold climates, um, one of the advantages of an over-the-road bus is you've got a lot of bays underneath, and those bays are great because you can heat them, you can put big water tanks in, and they won't freeze. I take my bus up skiing once in a while in Colorado, and I can be out when it's below zero, and I can turn on my heater. It'll heat my bays, okay? And if you don't have a heater in the bay, you can put even just one 60 watt light bulb in a bay will keep that water from freezing unless it gets really cold and windy but it doesn't take much to keep it from freezing if your tanks are bolted up they're held up with straps frames, unless you've got a heat blanket of some kind they're gonna freeze. when they freeze things crack and that's a bad thing with a, a 
gray water tank and a black water tank, you can put dump a bunch of salt in there and it won't freeze. And I used to do that with one of my rigs that had an external tank. Uh, it won't freeze, it'll just get slushy, but it won't freeze and crack your pipe in, okay? So if you want to build a four season bus, means you want to go snow skiing and stuff like that, or go camping in the snow, you want to make sure you have some way to insulate those tanks, or your tanks could be put under your bed or something like that. Okay, but that's a little challenging for a, a flush toilet. A flush toilet has got to be gravity feed down, so it kind of has to be down under the floor. Make sure you design a place for your co-pilot to rest their feet. A lot of people have seats up front for the co-pilot by the entrance door and their feet are dangling and that's really uncomfortable. Anybody who goes skiing knows that. When you're going up on a ski lift and you get your skis and boots hanging down, it pulls down. Well, the same thing over several hours in a bus. Your feet will get really tired hanging on the edge of the seat. So you want some kind of a floor under there. It can be a fold down floor, it could be air operated, it could be a linear actuated floor, anything to get a floor out there of some kind or put the passenger seat back a little bit so they have their own floor instead of the hole in the floor. Now my bus when it was converted that front door was moved to the middle of the bus. When you look at my bus out there as a mid-entry, that made the floor completely solid under the passenger and all the way up front. Plus the floor was raised on my bus too. It used to be down about eight inches and there was a step, but it was raised up so it's all one level. So that's, that's a kind of an extreme you can do, but some people do that, okay? They go through quite a bit of work to do that. But the other disadvantage of having the, the door up front is it whistles and whines and leaks all the time. It's hard to seal those doors. Anybody that's got a bus knows that. Okay, by, by moving the door back, the contour of the bus is easier. It's easier to shape it and you won't get so many leaks. That's one other advantage of that. But it's overkill for most people. You want to design your cabinet so it fits full-size plates. Some people build buses and the cabinets are small. Uh, they get a little more room in the bus, but they can't get a full-size plate in. So that we recommend, or somebody recommended that, okay? It's not something I thought of because I've never read into that. Um, you need to design a way to keep your latches closed. And the refrigerator, if you've got a domestic refrigerator, uh, like in a house, that door can fly open. And I had a door fly open once and it broke the hinges off and then it created a new mess, you know. The hinges aren't that rugged, so I bought new hinges to put it back on. But if there's a way to latch it closed, that prevents that from happening. I've got latches on mine. They're just manual latches. So that's always a good idea. Same with drawers. Drawers will fly open when you go around the corner. You want some way to latch them. I've got ship latches in mine, so I can push them in and they lock. Um, but some kind of latch mechanism is also good. Even if it's just Velcro in the back of the drawer or under the face, that usually will hold them in unless you go around the door real sharp, okay? Or real fast. You want to lay out your floor plan when you start your bus with masking tape. Um, your walls are generally two to three inches t thick, so you want to use two or three inch masking tape. Lay it around on the floor. It shows where the walls are going to go. And something that's confined like a bathroom you may want to mock it up with cardboard like a three-dimensional thing i've done that before and then you actually sit in there and move around and make sure you've got enough elbow room and everything else the same with a shower a shower can look good and look big but once you get into it you may find it kind of crowded and the curved part of the roof is going to affect you too you may want to tend to stand over a little bit more so you've got to know for that so it's a good idea to build a 3d mock-up of that stuff out of cardboard You want to design your bus so you can boondock, okay? One of the advantages of buses, and I boondock a lot, is you don't have to hook up to anybody, you don't have to visit anybody, you can live out in the desert if you want and be a hobo or hermit or whatever, okay? But one of the advantages of a bus, you don't have to be hooked up to power and water, you can just go any place. And when I travel, I stay in rest areas a lot, I just pull in next to the truckers or, or in truck stops. I don't need hookups. So you want to design your bus so you can boondock, and we recommend at least a week and my bus will go two to three weeks. I can go three if I don't shower for a long time, okay. <laughs> but if I'm around people, I can't usually get three weeks out of my bus. A couple weeks is good. But I've got 160 gallons of fresh water, 100 gallons of black, 100 gallons of gray. And that's a pretty, pretty sizable tank setup, okay. And I travel alone quite a bit of, or most of the time. Uh, one bus I had, it was an MC7 combo bus, which is a heavy-duty 1972 bus that carried transmissions and stuff. I had two tanks in that. One was 250 gallons of fresh water, and the other one was 250 gallons of gray and black water mix. I could go a month in that bus. That was designed for a guy that was going to uh, Alaska. 
And the advantage of the big tanks is you don't have to fill and dump as much. The disadvantage is it takes longer to fill and dump. But the, the other advantage is you, you have to pay a dump fee so many places. Now, 25 years ago, you could dump free any place. But now even Flying J's, I don't know, they're probably charging $15 now. I don't even go there anymore. But if you're dumping, they don't care if you got 50 gallons or 250 gallons. So the bigger the tank, the, you know, you get better economy out of that, dump a big tank for a fixed price. The drawback, again, is it can take a while to fill it, so if there's people behind you, sometimes you might have to go around and come back if you're a nice person uh, when you're filling your tank, because you can only fill 250 gallons so fast or 60 gallons a minute, it takes a while. You want to keep maintenance records of your bus. You want to keep track of the oil changes and everything you do, every part you put in. And what, you want to always know uh, what your oil filter numbers are and fuel filters and that. You want to carry an extra set of oil filters what happens on a bus quite a bit if you go off-road is you can get a rock kicked up by the back wheel and punch a hole in the oil filter. And then you're looking back there and you got an oil streak. So if you've got an extra oil filter, you can just switch it out, put another one on quick, and you're back on the road if you're lucky. Now, your engine will shut down if it's a newer engine if the oil level gets too low or the oil pressure gets too weak. But the older buses don't. They'll just keep on going. But if you see oil dripping or something, you may have a small leak in that oil filter because they're very vulnerable. So you always want to carry extra oil filters and fuel filters. And, and I have a full set of filters as well as for my generator because the generator, I, I have to change that oil quite frequently. The recommended interval is every 100 to 200 hours. And I run my generator going down the road because that's the only way I keep things cool in there with the air conditioners this summer. So I've changed my oil already four times this summer and usually I can get almost a full year out of it just because it was so hot this year. But I always get a set, carry a set of filters. At the very least, if you don't, write down the numbers so you can go down to Napa and tell them what you want, okay? And your number may not match up what they've got, but they get cross-reference records so they can find a filter for you, whether it's Fram or a Donaldson filter or whatever. So that's a little bit about maintenance records. You want to keep good maintenance records of everything you do to the bus. And that also helps for resale. Now, if you buy a used bus, you usually don't get the maintenance records, okay? Because you buy a bus as is, where is. And a lot of companies will destroy the maintenance records before you buy them. Just be aware of that. So if they say, oh, well, we don't have any maintenance, don't assume they didn't do maintenance. Assume that they don't want the liability if you bought the bus and you went back to them two weeks later and say, hey, I thought you just changed the oil. And maybe you did or didn't, but they just don't want the liability of that proof. So it's hard to get maintenance records from any company now. This, uh, the first bullet says be careful of what kind of wood you use in your bus, like birch will be a problem if it's in a dry climate it can expand and contract and crack and all that stuff it says uh, you don't need two by fours i see a lot of people building schoolies out of two by fours two by twos are plenty rugged enough and my bus in fact none of my buses have ever had a two by two or two by four and they just built a three quarter inch vertical plywood but they're attached to the top and the bottom and they've got support corners you know just one by three pieces of wood and that's plenty rugged enough you don't need to you know buy out a pallet of two by fours to build a bus. So look at some of the designs that are out there and you can see a lot of those um, by research and a lot of bus builds. You can see how they're built. Okay. And another thing we have on our website is uh, uh, the bus converters Bible and it tells you all this stuff and that's free to all subscribers. And it's like a, I don't know, three or 400 page book, I guess, everything you need to know about building a bus, but it'll tell you how to build the walls and stuff and how to build cabinets and stuff like that. You don't need to use a lot of heavy wood for that. You might want to consider, a, well, first of all, it says add your plumbing in. Add your plumbing in first because the plumbing is going to tell you uh, where, you, you know, you're going to put your toilet and your sinks and all that, but that's going to tell you where your lines have to run. So lay that out and make sure you can do all that before you build any walls. And then with plumbing and electrical, once you get it all roughed out, as we call it in the business, I used to be an electrician, we'd rough it out and then we put walls on. We'll take photographs of all these wires and all this plumbing and keep them w with your bus later. It's good for resale too, because if something goes wrong, you got a leaky pipe, you might want to look at those pictures and see, well, where are the connections? Where are the joints? Where are the elbows? Because that's going on. Okay? So take photos of everything before you close it in. You might want to consider building an all electric coach. It's an all electric coach. I don't have any propane on board. It's electric stove, it's electric refrigerator, everything's electric. Well, mine's a 12 volt refrigerator, it's kind of uncommon. But an all electric coach has some advantages. First of all, it's less likely to catch on fire. Secondly, the you got to turn them off before you go to the tunnel, and that's just kind of a hassle. Any RV.
RV, they'll pull you over. They'll make sure you turn it off, and then when you get there, you can turn it back on if you want. Electric coaches don't have that problem. And refrigerators and appliances are so efficient now. That's really not a big deal to have an all-electric coach. Lithium batteries and solar, and I've got all that stuff. I mean, I can pretty much go a whole day without running a generator or requiring power in any way. Be flexible with your design. Once you lay your bus out, a lot of people lay it out, then they realize, oh, this doesn't work, or the bathroom's not big enough, the shower's not big enough, the shower should be here. Or they find out they're ready to cut a hole in the floor for the toilet, and there's a structural rib there or something. So they've got to move the toilet over eight inches or something. So you've got to kind of be flexible with your design because it's probably going to change. And you can ask anybody that's ever built a bus, you know, would you do something different next time? And everyone says yes, they would. Because we ask that when people send us articles. What would you do different? They've always got several ideas. So, well, in the last one I read, I proofread an article. It's going to go in an issue coming up. Well, I wish I had a bigger inverter and more batteries. You know, that's something people underestimate a lot. Uh, or, or they want a, a bigger refrigerator. There's always things they want to change, bigger tanks. Be flexible because you, you know, your bus is never finished. You're going to be modifying it forever. Okay, but the best thing to do is get a lot of experience with buses and make sure you lay everything out the way you want it the first time the best you can. But be flexible because you're going to be changing things. A lot of people lay it out on the floor with tape. They start building the wall. Say, well, that's not quite right. I can move that wall over. So, you know, it, you got to be able to change your mind. You want to keep it simple. Use the KISS method um, and lay out different scenarios if you have to with the, the bed turned sideways or the bed turned, you know, parallel with the bus or perpendicular to the bus. Try different scenarios. Make it up out of cardboard and do it both ways. There's not a lot of room on the side of beds once you build them in. And it's really hard to build to get sheets on when it's up against the wall. It's ideal to have room walking around it. Okay? And you can have a lot of storage in your bed. Okay, so you can plan that into your, your layout. Now, if you've got a rear engine bus, you're going to have to make your bed so it folds up or removable because there's times you've got to get to the top of that engine, especially if it's a diesel engine. The starters on those engines are sometimes on the top and they're really heavy and you can't get them out any other way. So if there is an access hole in your bus now over the rear engine, make sure you build around that access hole so you can always get back into that part of the engine. A lot of people just floor it right over, build a bed permanently, then they take it into the shop, then they got to cut their bed out and cut the flooring out. And I've seen that happen more than once because they didn't realize, you know, that's actually an access hatch. It's not there just for looks. So that's kind of important to be able to have access pens. Over your fuel tank, there's probably an access panel for the fuel sending unit. Right now, my fuel sending unit is bad. I don't have an access hole. I've got six inches of clearance. I think I could crawl in and pull it out. But if not, I've got to cut a hole in the floor if I want to change that out or drop the tank. And dropping the tank is an option, but it's not the easiest thing to do. Some do's. Focus on the current project. If you're working on the bedroom, maybe finish the bedroom. That gives you a sense of accomplishment. Then work on the kitchen or work on the living room. You know, kind of do it in, in stages so you get some feeling of accomplishment as you get certain things done. Paint your bus. A yellow school bus is a no-no in a lot of states. Okay, it's got to be painted. International school bus yellow is not a legal color in many states. And if you get, or you're driving around with that, and especially if it's, it's still a school bus on the side, you will be pulled over and they'll make you tow your bus someplace to paint it. And also, if you've got a stop sign that comes out on the side of the bus, that's going to be taken off too. That's not legal. On our blog, there's an article by the guy that owns a Husky bus up there. He's a school bus driver, but he also investigates school bus accidents. And he wrote an article about yellow school buses. Most states, you got to paint them, or if you registered in one state, you drive it to another state, they still could be a problem. Maybe it's not illegal, but if they pull you over and they tie you up, you know, it's just kind of a hassle. So if you've got a school bus, yellow bus, you may want to consider painting that. And painting that can be as easy as scuffing it up and painting with a hand brush, you know, a paintbrush. I've seen that done before. I get my bus painted on a beach in Mexico. I take it down there every year, and I have them paint one side or do something. I'm out on the beach taking my marketers. They're, they're there with their, their spray guns. They're painting my bus, you know. So there's other ways to do it. Um, you can have it painted in the States, too. In Mexico, you can get it done for half the price and drink margaritas, okay? So there's different ways to do that. But most people will paint their own bus. It's not a big deal. It, a bus isn't going to last you 50 
years anyway. It's probably not going to last as long as mine. And so what if you got to paint it every 10 years? Not a big deal. If you paint it with Rust-Oleum, a lot of people do that. If you paint it with rust -Oleum, it yellows over time. And we found kind of a bad color. Uh, Rust-Oleum in itself is good. I like the paint. But painting it like a off whiter or light brown, that tends to yellow. So just be aware of that. If your bus is out in the sun, okay? Does anybody bus out in the sun? Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? Okay, so watch out for that. And paint your roof white because that'll reflect a lot of heat uh, versus the darker color. If you're building from scratch, you've got to consider whether you want to, to leave the windows in or taking them out. I'm a fan of leaving as many windows in as possible. I had an MCI bus and it was all locked on the inside on our website on the board. And we painted the inside of the window, not the window, but the wall because all the windows were tinted anyway, so it just looked like a regular window. But the windows were left in, and we could all, and, and it's, it's an emergency access as all these over the road buttons. Take that off, and, which just means if you got to get in there for anything, you take the window up and get in. But I recommend leaving as many windows as you can in. The only disadvantage to that is it lets in a lot of heat in the summer and cold in the winter. Okay, so you might need something like thermal curtains or something like that. But it lets in a lot of light. Some people are adamant about covering all the windows up and leaving one porthole in there or something like that because they want to be more stealth. But it'll make the bus um, really dark inside. So unless you're going to use a lot of white paint inside, it's going to be dark. Next, dues. That talks about removing the windows again. And you can see how light some of these buses are with the windows left in. That makes a big difference. Painting the inside of the bus white, there's nothing wrong with that. It does brighten it up. In the old days, they used to use dark colored maple, and it looked like a coffin in there. It was really dark on the inside of a cave. But now the trend is to use lighter colors. This bus here, I'm not sure which one that one is. It came out of our magazine probably, but that's kind of a darker color down below, but the top is all white, and that brightens it up quite a bit. The only disadvantage of having a lot of windows is that it lets in a lot of dark at night, though. It's really dark in there at night then. Um, when you're building your bus, think about repairs. Stick the water on all the furniture in the try to get anything later because it's not like you're going to take the walls off. You really got to fight it. But with a bus conversion, if you're building it, you can build it with access ports and you can build it so it's easy to work on later on. With my bus, I had up in the corner, I had just a trim board that was vertical and below that was all my wiring. I could reach up and pull that wiring out and that ran the full length of the bus on both sides. easy. So there's a lot of advantages to that. But also, but always leave access points to everything. Make your water heater so you can get into it and get to the electrical. And water heaters, and most appliances and everything in a bus are good for 10 to 15 years. So if you do keep your bus that long, you're probably going to change them out. So think about that when you're building it. Same with the refrigerator. Refrigerator, when you put it in, make sure that there's a way to get it out later. Don't bolt it in and then build the cabinets around. Build the cabinet and then put it in. And, and the one thing I want to mention is a lot of people that have some real death traps going down the road because they'll set refrigerators, stoves, and all this stuff just floating in the air in there. And if they have a hit, got in an accident, that's going to be a projectile, and it's going to be going the same speed you are, and it's going to remain in motion. It's Newton's first law or something, right? It's going to keep on going if you stop. So everything in the bus needs to be bolted down, refrigerator, stove, microwaves, everything. Shouldn't be anything just sitting on the counter that could become a projectile. And like I said, I've seen too many buses that were built that way or flimsy built or refrigerator just kind of sitting in nowhere with a, a little shelf or something built next to it or something that it's not going to hold it back in an accident. Also, you might have to make sudden turns and swerves in the road. If you do that, you want to make sure that stuff is secure and doesn't come loose. The flooring, a lot of people will do their flooring last. I'm not a big promote, promoted of that, proponent 
um, when I took over the magazine, the guy I bought it from used to build buses, and they were log cabin buses. The first thing he did was put the ceiling up, all pine, naughty pine. Then he put the walls up around the windows. The last thing he did was the floor. But after that, he built the walls for the bathroom and the cabinets. Everything was built on top. And you might think, well, that's going to suck if you have to replace the floor later. Well, you're probably not going to replace the floor for quite a ways down the line. And yeah, it's going to suck. But trying to cut that wood in around the cabinetry and everything later, you're not going to save any wood because you're going to have all these odd cuts and pieces left over. It's not going to save you a whole lot. So there's two rules of thought on that. Put your flooring down and then build your cabinets, everything on top. And that's not too bad because you can put a new floor over it if you have to, or you can cut it out. It's not the end of the world, especially if it's tongue and groove flooring. You can pull it out and put a new flooring down. But some people will put the flooring in last because they say, well, it's going to get all scratched up. Well, yeah, it might get a little scratched up, but it's not something you couldn't buff out probably, depending on the floor. And, and carpet, I'm not a big proponent of carpet because for one thing, I have allergies. But another thing, when you go, when you're in a bus, you're stepping out on gravel, you're stepping out on dirt, you're stepping out on mud, you're on sand, if you're in Mexico on a beach and we park on a beach down there, you're tracking in sand. Well, that's the last thing you want in your carpet. It's not like a house where you've got a walkway that's paved that you walk up to. It's going to pick up a lot of crap and it's really hard to clean. Now, I knew a builder and he put carpeting in his kitchen, in his houses, all the houses he built, in his houses. He, I said, Don't, doesn't it get dirty in the kitchen? Yeah, but I replace it every year. Well, you know, he just has somebody come in and replace the carpeting. It's no big deal. But a wood floor is so much easier to clean. And I got one of those Rumba vacuum things and I put Swiffer pads on it. It goes around every night when I get home and cleans everything up. I pick it up, throw it away, and put it back in the cradle for charging. It's so much easier than dealing with carpets, okay? Now, you could have a throw carpet around the, in the bedroom if you want and make it so you could take it out and shake it out and shake the sand out from the beach. But hardwood flooring or any kind of wood flooring definitely is easier. Or even some of these uh, vinyl flooring, we used to call it linoleum. I guess that's not the right word anymore. But that's a whole lot easier to clean. And one four by four, I had a sports mobile. To clean that, I had an air hose in it and I had an onboard compressor. I just take the air hose and blow it out the door. You know, I could blow it out the back door from the front. It was so much easier because I had an onboard compressor to air up the tires anyway. It was a four wheel drive rig. So that, um, that was easy to clean but a simple broom or anything will clean these up as long as you don't have a lip at the one edge or something, you just kind of sweep it out without getting it caught in the lip or something. Some, some, another thing to be aware of, and this happened to me, I was reconverting a bus and I bought all the stuff, air conditioners and everything. It took me a couple of years to do it. By the time I got it done, I got my air conditioners on, one didn't work. Well. So you say, well, just it's warranty, take it back. Well, it's not, because the warranty ran out. Because <laughs> I bought them two years ago, I got a one-year warranty. And that, if you, if you buy it early, and you, and you go up to Elkhart, Indiana, and buy all this stuff, get a truckload of stuff at half price from these oversales and stuff, and you can bring them back, and then you build your bus and spend five years. Well, they're going to be out of warranty by the time you get done. So just be aware of that. You may want to buy some of your things just before you put them in the bus and soon you put them and test them to make sure they work. Because in this case, I put them all in, I never tested them and I was ready to turn them on and I crap, you know, it didn't work. Checked all the wiring, everything checked out, but it had something bad in it and I ended up buying another new air conditioner. So be just aware of that. Secure everything in your bus. That's what the first line, uh, line says. So when you're taking corners or if you have to stop quick, you have somebody break checks and that happens once in a while. You don't want all that stuff come flying toward you. Um, check the engine oil and coolant frequently. If you're building a bus, start driving it right away, you know, and, and get some things built in, take it on a test drive, but try, try to drive at least every month or two months or three months minimum, because the worst thing for a bus is sitting there. The seals dry out, um, oil's not circulating, it's really bad. If nothing else, at least start your bus. Run your generator under a load for a half an hour, get it up to temperature. A bus engine will never get up to temperature unless you take it on the road. Okay, you can sit there and fast idle it to two, 3,000 RPMs. It's not gonna get hot, okay? It's gotta be under a load. So the best thing to do when you're converting a bus is take it out every once in a while, take it for a ride. But we go back to rule number one, don't have a whole bunch of tools and power saws and skill saws and table saws in the bus so when you're driving it around if you're going to drive it you know at any distance or speed just be cognizant of that and be real careful of that but drive it once in a while 
start and run the generator, check the engine oil and coolant. Always do that before you start. Every time I start my bus in the morning, if I'm traveling, I check my coolant and I check my oil. If you don't do that, you could be out a $30,000 engine, okay? It, um, my engine will shut down because it's a modern engine. It's a 500 horsepower Series 60 engine, and it's a, it's a later model engine, so it's a, it checks all that. It's an electronics engine. If the coolant's um, low or oil pressure tool, or anything, it'll shut it down, okay? And you just can't drive it until you go figure out what's wrong, which is a bad thing because the older engines, you can keep them going forever. But the good thing is, it's not going to burn up. But I still check my engine oil and coolant before I start out every day. Run the dash heat and air conditioning, make sure everything's working. Test and run everything in the bus, everything that's installed so far. Turn on your water heater, run your water pump. Water pumps have got to be cycled too. Sometimes if you don't run them, they just don't work all of a sudden. Um, exercise the tires, wheel bearings, air bearings. That's what it does when you take it out. Those uh, airbags, I mean, they'll work back and forth and you got to keep them working. If you don't, you can get oil in the lines or water in the lines. If you don't bleed that water out, or if it doesn't go out through an air dryer, I mean, that can rust up and then you got fittings that rust and they blow out when you don't want it. So try to run everything as though you're on a long trip. Test everything, every time. Use stranded wire for wiring. If you use solid wire, like house wire, going down the road, the, the bus is bouncing. It's like in an earthquake all the time. And the ends that are fixed are uh, rigid but your wiring in the walls is floating up and down. Again, I was an electrician when I grew up. That was my dad's thing, so I work for him. But every connection is rigid where your wire can be bounced up and down. That'll break off after a while. And if it breaks off and it's real close, you've got an arcing thing. Well, you've got an arcing thing that's bad because that could potentially start a fire. So again, always be aware of that. Use stranded cable. The best thing is a marine cable. Marine cable is built for that. Marine cable costs quite a bit more. I don't know what a 250 foot roll costs now, 14.2, but it's probably not cheap, probably over $100 now, maybe 200. But, you know, it's a bus. You don't want it to burn down when you get the whole thing done either. You got a smoke detector or whatever, and you got fire extinguishers, but if you're not in that bus when the fire starts, or even if you are, if you're not sure what you're doing, the bus is going to go up in flames because the fire department is not going to get there quick enough to save your bus. So just be careful of all these things, all your electrical connectors and everything. For larger buses, anything over 20 or 30 feet, go the 50 amp service. You might need it later, and every RV park is 50 amps now. Some people will use 30, some people will use 20 amp service. But if you've got an air conditioner, if you've got two air conditioners, you can run on 30 amps, but you can't run the microwave or anything else. So it's best just to go with 30 amps unless you've got a really small bus. If you've got one air conditioner, then 30 amps may be fine. But if you decide to add another one later, you're SOL because you're going to have to, you know, not only make put a bigger power cable in, but you're going to have to put a new uh, circuit panel in as well because the circuit, or at least a main circuit breaker, okay, and you might want more circuits at the time anyway. And you've got to figure out what you're going to run. Um, and you should design it for the maximum load, like you want to run all your air conditions, your refrigerator, your microwave, your stove all at one time, figure out the max draw. Um, that's what they do when they build the professional coaches. My bus is not quite, well, my bus is pretty well designed, but if I turned on all of the air conditioners, my washer dryer, and also my stove at the same time, and everything, uh, it could blow a main breaker, okay? So it's just overloaded a little too much. So if you're smart about it, um, and don't turn everything on at one time, like now if I want to use the microwave, I just turn off one air conditioner, it's not a big deal. And this summer I had to run them all three a lot. So you need to design for the maximum. And if you're gonna put a generator in your bus, put one big enough. I got a 12.5 kW generator in mine on board, and that'll run all three air conditioners. It'll run everything. But again, if I turn on one extra thing, it could blow a breaker. So you wanna figure out the maximum load and try to design around that. The same with solar, if you're putting solar on. It takes 600 to 1,000 watts of solar for an average bus, and that's quite a few panels. Some other things about electrical, Make sure you can control everything from up top. Like if you've got water pumps and you've got heaters and stuff in the basement, make sure the switch is up in the cabin. Make sure your power panel is up there because sure as hell the first rainstorm or snowstorm, you're gonna go out and you're gonna have to go outside your bus if the breaker box is underneath and open the bays and pull everything out and crawl in and flip a breaker. Well, that needs to be up in the main part of the bus in the bedroom or someplace in the middle of the bus will reduce your wire run someplace around the kitchen and maybe you're in the front part. Put your power panel up there so you can turn anything on or off from inside the bus without going outside. 
create a wiring schematic when you're wiring it. Design, create a wiring schematic of where all your go, wires go. Uh, wiring diagram and wiring schematic are two different things, but one basically is the wiring schematic is like on the left. Well, that's more of a diagram on the left, but it shows you where all the wires go. If you draw those out later on when you have problems, you can trace them. And when you sell your bus, if you sell your bus, that's also a good selling point to show where the wires go. Because otherwise, you've got to trace wires with a wire finder, which is a beeping thing, which is kind of a hassle tracing wires out. And also, like I said before, take photos of all the wiring before you close the walls in so you can see all that. A couple more things. Um, don't start with an old worn out bus. Again, get a bus that's in better condition because you're going to spend so much time getting it up in the working, legal, running condition, um, which is fine, but it's going to cost you a lot more than you think. And it also, it's also going to delay the time that you can get on the road. It's better to buy a bus that's in good running condition. Then you can pull the seats out tear out the bathroom if it's got a bathroom, start building it and you can get it done so much quicker, okay? The other thing is if you buy an old warm bus and fix it up and then you start building the interior, well, some of this stuff may wear out, you know, before you take it on the road or at least be out of warranty again. Don't cover any access panels, it says. Um, don't use nails in the framing, always use screws and use those star head screws. They don't strip out as, as much. Um, which is not a big problem until you try to take them out. But a Phillips head screw, it's kind of a poor design anyway. When you're screwing them in, they kind of semi-strip, and then we try to back them out, they permanently strip. So the star-headed screws are so much better for that. And they're a Canadian thing. So the Canadians have something on us there, okay? They're just a whole lot better design. Uh, don't use carpeting, it says. When you build a bus, make sure you keep, um, um, keep financially in your budget where you need to be. And if you have a school bus, you better have $5,000 cash on you at all times and the over-the-road bus at least $10,000 because breakdowns are costly. At $120 to $160 an hour for somebody to fix your bus, it's very expensive. And I've seen way too many GoFundMe um, people out there asking for money when they didn't set money aside. If you can't afford a $10,000 breakdown or a $5,000 breakdown with a school bus, you know, you may want to reconsider getting a bus because they can be expensive to fix unless you're your own mechanic, okay? And a lot of people that convert a bus can do a lot of work themselves, change the oil, do all the maintenance, and also do change fan belts and stuff like that. So that uh, definitely can save you a lot of money if you do your own work. Um, have a plan B if your bus breaks down. And what I do and I recommend to people is I've got a Marriott Affinity card uh, most people would probably be better off with a Holiday Inn, but I've always stayed in Marriott's when I was, had a real job. Um, but every dollar I spend on that bus, any dollar I spend for my business, goes on the Marriott card, so I get points. So if I broke down, break down like I did, I had to have wheel bearings replaced in Anaheim, California last year. Um, it took them three days by the time we got the parts in. Well, most people, most places let me stay in their parking lot and I can sleep there while they're working on the bus, but it was hot, they wanted it in the shop, and, I've lived in shops before, it's no fun, but they didn't, they didn't invite me to do that. So I needed a hotel room for three days. Well, my Marriott points came in candy. I stayed three days in the Marriott for free because I had all these points accumulated. So an affinity card with one of the hotel chains uh, really comes in handy for that because buses do break down if you're full time. And also, even if you're not full time, if you take off and across the country, if you break down, you're going to need a place to stay. And again, they may not let you stay in your bus due to they always say it's insurance regulations, but it's usually they just don't want you on their property, okay? So just be aware of that. Or carry a tent with you and be ready to camp. But somebody broke down on the way here. They lost a drive shaft, okay? And guess what? They're here. Their bus is 100 miles away from here, okay? Um, so they're staying here with friends, but, you know, be aware of stuff like that. Let's see, that's about it. What else do we have? Last minute tips on uh, hotel amenity, uh, affinity card. If you haven't subscribed to Bus Conversion Magazine, there's flyers on the back chair there, but in the back area. But if you subscribe to that, we post 165, last I knew, back issues on our site. They're all online. You can go on and read them, and you can read about what people have done to their buses. And every issue has a design of a bus on it. It tells you how they built it, why they built it, what kind of bus it is, what they did to it, and everything they added. So uh, I recommend you read as many back issues. I read every back issue before I bought my bus, and that may be a little overkill, but you know I was really into it by then. And keep an eye on our forum. We have a forum 
uh, gets 11 million page views every year, and people post questions about um, their buses, and if something goes wrong, they break down. You know, usually within an hour or 10 or 15 minutes, somebody, and if you post where you are, somebody will say, well, yeah, I know this mechanic, call him, or they'll come out and help him bring parts. Okay, so that's really helpful too. And one more slide. So we probably don't have time for, no, Swab 01. So if you've got questions, I'll be outside for a little bit. I can answer any questions you want, but I want to finish on time because we've got another presenter coming up. So thanks for coming. Sometimes. Do sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I wanted to show right. you real quick the AeroPress. Um, it is a French press that is designed for small space. And so this box is actually bigger than what the AeroPress is. Thank you. <laughs> everything is right in here, including the cups. So everything you need to make coffee is right there. And so it's so easy. I, a bunch of us in the tiny dweller village have them, so they don't take up much space. And Thank you. And I'm going to give you the hmm. mic back if you want. We're going to okay. jump off of the live stream, but you've got the crowd if you want to keep going. Okay. Yeah, anybody's welcome to leave if you got your ear filled up. If anybody's got questions, just ask.